Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Energy Transition Dialogue's two-minute warning feature interview. Uh, uh, this week, we're delighted to be joined by Mr. Uh, Nuki Utama, Executive Director of ASEAN Center for Energy. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Utama, for joining us uh, and taking the time to be with us uh, today. Uh, we, on this particular interview series, delve into the general energy trends globally that are impacting uh, countries and businesses uh, and look at the energy transition agenda and the challenges also that that is facing uh, within certain regions and in the, some of the solutions that are being put forward both on the policy front uh, and by uh, the private sector. So thank you for joining us and I suppose I'd like to start by asking you um, you know, uh, around the theme of the elephant in the room, which is still with us six months on, which is the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, which, which many countries and businesses have been grappling with, and we are still in it uh, and not out of the woods yet. It's now September the 1st. So six months into this, um, Dr. Nuki, to, to ask you, you know, what is your overall, the, how have you seen the impact of the pandemic on the Southeast Asian countries with regards to their energy policies and energy transition policies in particular? Uh, and, and has that been, had a, had, a, had a positive or a negative impact in terms of the speed of transition and policy um, going forward? Yes, first of all, I'd like to thanks for this opportunity to share with you. Uh, indeed, this pandemic uh, having a big impact in the region. I think it's globally also having a quite significant impact. Um, uh, in the energy sectors, especially on the demand sectors, uh, it is showing that a lot of uh, decrease of demand of energy, uh, mostly on the uh, oil and gas as well as the electricity. So uh, it is also reported that in the first uh, three to four months, uh, some of the country in the region uh, declining of of, of its electricity demands up to 20%, from 10 to 20%. Uh, electricity demand was uh, uh, going down. So uh, in terms of the oil and gas demands also having a similar figures. Uh, therefore, uh, the, the governments uh, need to have a, a quick look on the how to, to, to see in the possibilities of designing the energy transition uh, in the future. I believe uh, you mentioned, the design yeah, I mean, just, be just to pick up on one thing that you mentioned there, the electricity, obviously, uh, usage, uh, along with oil and gas, yes. has dropped both in the ASEAN countries and, and, and globally, of course, yes. uh, and elsewhere in Asia as well. I mean, the, the ASEAN, I believe, has, the group has, has, has set itself, for example, uh, a target of reaching a 25% meeting electricity usage 25% through renewables. You're not there yet. Um, has, has the pandemic slowed that activity towards that target down, do you think? Uh, what, what impact has that had on policy, on, on, on cooperation on that? Uh, we do have a 2023 target on 23% uh, RE target. Uh, uh, indeed, it is uh, having an uh, impact on those uh, target right now the percentage is around 14.6 percent, and even wow. harder to reach 23 percent on 2023. Uh, according to our prediction, uh, our models, uh, it, because of the pandemics, uh, the impact is uh, quite uh, significantly uh, reduce uh, the potential of uh, uh, reaching or achieving 23 percent target, more or less around 4 percent. Uh, behind the target. It is quite alarming for us that uh, the plan that we have for the last couple of decades is being uh, corrected by this condition, uh, especially on the decreasing of the energy demand as well as uh, uh, having difficulties to keep up on uh, reaching the RE target that we plan to have uh, previously. Is that, I mean, has, has the slowdown, as you said, it's, it's made you fall further behind uh, the target that you were trying to achieve. Is that an expenditure issue, an income issue, um, or is it a hesitancy to proceed with plans that were already in place? 
because of putting demand aside, but in terms of the resources that, that the countries would be put forward to planning in terms of structural inf infrastructure and expenditure on reaching those targets. Is it a hesitancy over expenditure, uh, a lack of finance? Uh, basically, uh, the biggest impact of the COVID-19 is the economic. Uh, therefore, the, the member states uh, try to focus on the giving a stimulus on the economics. And energy part of the uh, uh, driver, driving factors to increase the potential of the, uh, the, the economic growth. Therefore, they also try to push or uh, to give incentive in the energy sectors, uh, such as in the electricity, as I also uh, previously mentioned that the demand is reducing. So they try to give an incentive on the electricity to, to push the, the consumption of the electricity. Uh, Has that worked? I mean, what have they done? They've reduced tariffs, I assume, or they've reduced the charges or, or payment plans. How, has it worked? Has it, have those incentives worked in the last few months? Yeah, some, some of the country, there are uh, uh, plenty of policies uh, going around in, in, the, in the region because we do have 10 member states. Some countries do give an incentive for, for, for some uh, particular uh, residential sectors or some industrial sectors. Uh, yeah, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen it yet, the, the, the benefit of it, because most of those uh, incentives goes to the uh, residential sectors, and only two countries goes in the industrial sector's incentive. So uh, I realize in, in, in that uh, perspective, uh, we think that the government should give more incentive on industrial sectors in order to boost the economic growth rather than only focusing on the residential sectors. So this is the first thing that uh, we are facing now. So um, based on those, uh, you can see how difficult for, for the member state to go to give more uh, incentive on the, on, the, on the transition sectors, which is one of those is renewable energy sectors. So it is also being, having a quite big impact on the growth of the RE in the region. But uh, once the, the economic uh, bounce back, once the, 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 the pandemic gone and then the economic bounce back, the energy demand also uh, returned back to its normal, uh, then I believe the energy transition also back to the, to the uh, normal <clears throat> trace. Okay, Thank, okay, Dr. Nikki, just, just to stay on, say, say a little bit on the big picture stuff before we delve into more, more, more specifics in, in, within countries or within private sector, perhaps policies as well, and the government. Um, I mean, part of uh, ASEAN's mission is, is a sort of to, to, to help format a cohesive inter-nation policy on, on energy and cooperation and uh, perhaps initiatives on, on things such as R&D uh, and innovation towards the energy transition. Do you, do you see that happening with ASEAN? Do you see that being uh, accelerated as a result of the pressure, the economic pressure that's come about because of the pandemic? Has, has that triggered more cooperation, uh, more cohesive, um, um, I suppose, incentive to, to, to cooperate on certain joint initiatives? Or have you seen the opposite where nations have uh, got, gone their sort of separate ways in terms of surviving this, this particular period? Um, yes. Um, uh, regarding with those uh, impacts, I think that each country try to uh, survive and try to give a stimulus within their own country first. But the interesting thing is that uh, the intense communication and the coordination amongst the member states, giving others uh, new uh, experience. I mean, uh, learning from other country how to deal with this pandemic uh, condition, how to deal with the decreasing of the demand, how to deal with the, the policy to give a stimulus uh, to, to, to the people. So um, coordination and, and exchange communication and learning uh, coming from other countries is important. Uh, but the joint cooperation, something like that, still not yet there. Uh, because of uh, each country is still focusing on their own, uh, you know, their own issues. I mean, one, of the, one of the, one of the um, uh, things that the, the ASEAN has, has been trying to sort of promote, I suppose, through its policy and through its cooperation is, is sort of the, uh, an ASEAN power grid. I mean, in the Middle East here, we have the same discussions over ideally have forming a power grid 
for, uh, uh, for, for the Gulf countries. There's, there's, it's obviously met certain obstacles. Where are we on that uh, in terms of the cooperation uh, and, and incentive to actually pro to cooperate more on that? I mean, it, it's clearly uh, the plus point is that it will achieve uh, better regional economic growth and faster as part of this energy transition. Where is ASEAN countries and members stand on that? Yes, I do agree the power grid will give uh, more or better economic growth as well. Uh, but this power grid uh, design and plan is already being implemented back uh, years uh, in the early 20, uh, 2000. And over there, still running right now. And now, uh, even, mm. even more tangible activities that we have. We do have uh, already agreement on the Lao, Thailand, Malaysia uh, agreement on the connected of the, of, the, of the grid itself. And the designing of the uh, power grid currently is being, I mean, uh, the work on those being, being fulfilled by our institution, ASEAN Center for Energy, on the works supporting by the, by the United States on the M3 projects. So uh, to find out the optimization value on, on how the optimum, uh, I mean, uh, cost will be there and how the, the VRE of variable nuclear energy can be uh, injected into the grid in the optimum way. Uh, and that's before and after COVID, the work still going on and now still going on uh, as scheduled, uh, no delay on those particular uh, work. Okay, Dr. Tama, I'd like to touch on, on, on coal. I mean, it's, it's a main, still a major power source in Asia, across Asia uh, and, and Southeast Asia as well. Um, clearly, as a, as a definition of a resource, it is, it, is, it is technically a dirty resource in this era of energy transition. And yet Asia does not really seem to be slowing down its coal consumption. In fact, it's increasing. Uh, we do have initiatives for clean coal, etc. That, that technology is now obviously offering. Where are we with that in Asia? And, and do you see uh, the region succeeding and making an exit from relying on that resource? Or, 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 or what is the solution to that? Uh, currently, the region still uh, <clears throat> rely on the affordable, uh, reliable, and of course, uh, uh, those is one of the priority or two or three priority in the region have. Uh, and, and coal and gas, uh, we do have still remaining uh, resource that we can uh, utilize uh, within our own uh, member state or being uh, exported. So that's why uh, coal and gas, especially coal, we still uh, try to utilizing it until it will last. Uh, based on our prediction, uh, of course, it will not last forever. Uh, currently, we are the importer of uh, the region, is the importer oil, uh, but we still have quite uh, sometimes on the coal and gas, approximately around 20 uh, up to 40 uh, years remaining of the, of the, of the resource uh, of both. Uh, have, yeah, I mean, the, the resources are there and they're remaining, but the argument is that they are not the cleanest <coughs> uh, type of fuel resource, obviously. And, and, and the fact is, you mentioned affordability there. The cost of the alternatives, renewables, solar, biofuels, etc., you know, have obviously come dramatically down in the last few years. Uh, and we've seen, obviously, certain uptake of that within certain Asian countries. And, but very varying levels of investment in that. Um, what is it going to take for certain economies and countries in Asia to, to make a fuller commitment to, towards the renewable space, if you like? I mean, China's doing its own thing and we know where that's at, but the other economies, the other countries, despite their internal resources that they have, the indigenous resources, what, the pace of that transition, is, is there enough incentive to do that? In uh, yes. Okay, yes, uh, before jumping on the RE and energy transition, of course, the coal, uh, as I mentioned, is affordable and reliable. We do have a program, we call it the ASEAN, uh, <clears throat> ASEAN Plan for Action uh, for Energy Cooperation, uh, which is one of the uh, program areas is the uh, coal, clean coal technology. So in order to go on the, uh, uh, the process on the transition itself, uh, we do have tried to uh, to utilize more on the uh, higher efficiency and low emission uh, coal power generation, for example. And in regard with the RE, 
uh, as you as you know that we do have plan on 22 percent uh, target in 2023 uh, 2025 uh, uh, where one of the uh, abundant resource of, of, of re which is biomass will be fully utilized in the region uh, we plan to have the we call it the biofuel and some of the country already have plan a solid plan on those we do have b10 b20 and one of the biggest country in the region indonesia plan also to have b100 uh, or, or by uh, biodiesel 100 which is 100 uh, percent fully coming from the uh, bio resource and then also in the power sectors uh, uh, in combination with the coal we plan to have a co-firing with the biomass as well so mm -hmm. upgraded biomass can be part of the uh, uh, coal uh, feedstock so uh, that's that's uh, uh, some of the example uh, the region tried to uh, keep up with the increases of RE by utilizing all of those uh, natural resources. Of course, yeah. wind and, and solar also, but it's not, wind, is, for example, it's not that much in cooperation with, with, with solar and others. Yeah, I mean, would you, would you say that in general, um, I mean, for example, the whole argument about putting a price on carbon and, and putting that on, uh, as a disincentive for, for future use of carbon, and obviously, the, you know, creating more efficiencies on that use and obviously cleaner energy, We've seen Europe make some progress on uh, pricing carbon, if you like, and, and, and making that as a disincentive for people to move away from that. In the US, for example, we've seen no success on that front and uh, from the federal point of view. In Asia, where, is, where are we there with, with, with progress towards the thinking on, on whether a price on carbon is worthwhile? Can it be implemented? Will it be taken up by industry? Um, where are we on the policy front there, and, and is there is there um, an incentive, and, and is there a strong push for it um, amongst the ASEAN governments and countries? Uh, in regard with the uh, carbon pricing, uh, I think we haven't we haven't have any uh, tangible uh, policy on those uh, carbon pricing since we are currently struggling with how we, we try to take off on becoming one of the uh big region with a big economic uh, development so we need a, a fundamentals of uh, uh, foundation which is energy is one of the fundamental uh, foundation so uh, whatever it is the region try to 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 make sure that the energy is first as i mentioned affordable reliable and of course we try as much as possible to be sustainable enough with the effort that we try to do whether it is a national effort as well as a regional effort. So by, by doing that, we try to uh, latch on, uh, first keep up in terms of the economic and energy, uh, and then and then later on we, we go uh, step by step on improving our, our policy on perhaps carbon uh, uh, taxing or carbon pricing as well. But uh, keep in mind that we also uh, having uh, quite good uh, figures in terms of the energy intensity uh, we do have a target 20 percent in 2020 and this year we already achieved uh, more than 24 percent or almost 25 percent energy intensity uh, target so in terms of efficiency and yes we do have i mean yes. one one art, be, be, beyond the environmental benefits of, of of accelerating a transition if you like uh, amongst countries is is that you mentioned the economic challenges that, that the ASEAN countries are having in particular in the last few months. And what about the employment market within the industry and within the energy sector? With the world moving towards an energy transition and with costs coming down and producing that type of energy, we're also seeing a lot of jobs created uh, within that sector. Uh, and yet if the focus you're saying of, of the ASEAN countries, which is still in, in a growth period, um, is, is, is to fuel themselves in whatever way they can to continue that economic growth. Um, are they missing an opportunity, would you say, in terms of the new job creation that, that, that can be created if they were to accelerate the move uh, on the transition front? Yes, I do agree. If we move on the transition uh, direction, uh, for example, the RE will create the local jobs more comparing with the fossil fuel. Indeed, it is agreeable on that. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we, we, I mean, we notice and we realize on those uh, potential, uh, but currently we're talking about current condition. 
uh, we are focusing on how to bring the economy back by giving the a big incentive on how the energy can be uh, returned back on its normal phase. Uh, that's that's a quite important things to do. But later on, if we go or already go back on the or bounce back on the on the on the on the, on the right track. I mean, after COVID nineteen, then uh, the RE will be uh, go back again on on on, on the business uh, uh, on the energy sectors. I think that will be uh, something like that. Uh, Dr. Nuki, I mean, I'd like to ask you again, take it more to the macro geopolitical front um, on the US sort of China relations uh, and trade, et cetera, and, and how that's impacted global economy this year, putting COVID aside. Uh, what's your viewpoint in terms of the interests of the ASEAN countries if we were to see a change of administration in the US come November? Uh, and we saw a Biden presidency, a Democratic president come into to the White House. Presumably, as everyone is saying, he would sign the US back onto the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, but in terms of any policies of the US towards Asia, and particularly China, and how that might be impacting the thinking within the energy policy of ASEAN countries, well, is that in, any, in, in, in your thinking and in, 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 the, in, in, in the vision, also, I, I suppose, of ASEAN, uh, at the moment, or, or factoring as as a uh, as an influence on policy. Um, the region itself is very neutral in these uh, geopolitical uh, issues. Uh, we do have a lot of help coming from the from the states as well as from Europe, and of course coming from China and Russia. Of course, uh, all of those country and region uh, hand to hand with us to work on the how to to secure and make affordable and reliable energy uh, in the region. Uh, we, last uh, week, I think, we just uh, finished our uh, meeting, uh, the, the uh, senior officials meeting of energy. We also invite uh, uh, Russia, China, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, United States, uh, even New Zealand uh, to discuss uh, the energy uh, issues and also giving us a uh, situation and also collaboration activities on the energy sector. So we are welcome with any countries and once again, neutral on the geopolitical issues. Do you feel that, I mean, there's been a lot of talk that, that the, the crisis, the COVID crisis and, and global economic pandemic has refocused um, attention of governments on the climate uh, challenge uh, and um, that actually it has re, uh, reinvigorated uh, activity on, on climate change policies and, and accelerated that and uh, even has proven that should expenditure be needed to spend on the economies, it can, it can come. Uh, and, and therefore that should be an accelerator uh, to, to the energy transition and to climate change policies being pursued by certain countries. Would you agree with that? Uh, the most important thing in our region is, uh, yeah, we're realizing that uh, some of the fossil fuel-based energy sources uh, somehow uh, giving a bad impact on the environment. Uh, and that's uh, one of the things that we are really considering it. Uh, on the environmental impact or damage coming from the fossil fuel uh, processes. Uh, and also, of course, emission. If you're looking at uh, the cities in South Asia currently, uh, caused by the COVID-19, is a clear, clear uh, blue sky over there. So it means that the emission coming from exhaust pipe, uh, if you looking at in that perspective, which is sometimes, uh, of course, giving a bad emission and giving a bad look in the city, a bad air in the city. And after COVID-19, uh, people are realizing that uh, putting a bad uh, fuel in the car will also result in a bad air in the city. So hopefully after the COVID-19, this is one of the benefits. In fact, we, we, we don't see uh, COVID-19 as a, only having a bad impact, but this, there is a benefit of it that we, uh, we, 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 we can uh, educate the people that if you give a good uh, I mean, uh, source in your uh, tile pipe, then the city will be uh, cleaner. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the city and urban planning, obviously, and, and a lot of very um, uh, condensed cities, if you like, in, in the ASEAN nations, some of them are very heavily populated, 
Um, you mentioned uh, vehicles, etc. I mean, obviously, battery power is, is battery cars, electric vehicles are, are out there. They're perhaps not quite commercially viable for your average user, but we're getting there. Um, hydrogen has been another um, uh, source that's been touted uh, and vector that's been touted in the last few months in particular. Obviously, it's nothing new, but it has, it has caught a lot of attention and investment. Um, uh, as, as another clean uh, source for mobility, whether it's for cars or for heavier transport. Um, is, are the ASEAN nations looking at that from a policy front at all uh, as, as something to invest into in terms of part of their urban planning? Um, yes, in terms of the end users technology, uh, we do uh, really considering all of the options including, as you mentioned, the hydrogen. We also considering the electricity vehicles. And of course, uh, BICE or biofuel-based uh, internal combustion engine or, uh, or, yeah, yeah, or for, for the transportation sectors. So we try to, uh, looking at the whole perspective and try to uh, make sure that our decision is not uh, in the wrong decision where we go or we only focusing in one uh, selection. So we have to make sure that Again, it is secure enough. For example, if you put all within with, 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 with electricity vehicles, for example, in Indonesia itself, you will have increases 20 gigawatt uh, electricity capacity uh, increases. For example, if you have uh, another 100 million, million uh, motorcycles, for example. So those kind of uh, plans should be designed clearly and have to 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 uh, you know to involving all of the stakeholders on energy sectors as well as experts on energy sector to redesigning uh, the energy scenario and planning for for the member states so how we can go uh, after the COVID-19 as I mentioned the economy is impacted the energy demand also impacted the target is 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 is, is uh, perhaps we be missed then we need to redesign again our scenario and planning. And over there, we can put some of those, uh, for example, the technology that perhaps beneficial in the future, uh, more cleaner and also, of course, more affordable and reliable for the region. And in terms of any uh, R&D on innovation that is, that is being done uh, by the countries, obviously you have certain strong R&D centers around the world and academia, uh, and, and those are, those are known. What 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 kind of budgeting is being put forward by the governments, if you like, of the ASEAN countries going forward towards more indigenous R and D into innovation, into finding uh, and sourcing the technologies that are going to ha help these countries reduce their costs, make this transition, or are you still primarily relying on importing? knowledge and technology. I mean, your neighbors, Japan, South Korea, China are behemoths in, in, in technology uh, creation. Uh, what, what, what is the policy that going forward? Is it, are you an importer of technology or is there an incentive to, to start having uh, some kind of indigenous development of that? Uh, yeah, indigenous development or R&D is very important and uh, we do have plenty of activities on the R&D sectors in the region. And realizing it that we are a lag behind on top of the uh, technology advancement uh, on the power sector, for example, in the transportation for uh, transport sector, sector, for example. So uh, uh, realizing those, uh, we are now, or even uh, back a few decades ago, we already started on on, on involving on the on the R and D in each member state to go ahead on the on the on the on the direction of energy transition. For example, the, the biofuel, our R&D is quite strong in terms of the biofuel sector. So, so we don't only rely on imported uh, technology in that sense, but some other uh, sectors, for example, power sectors, if other country having more efficient uh, power generation, for example, we also open on those accepting the technology and, 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 and together we learn how to improve our current power sectors uh, to be more efficient and reliable. And, and just one last question on that, in terms of partnerships between the R&D and as of academia world that is, it is pursuing that, and the private sector, 
we see in other parts of the world a lot of cooperation between you know, the energy sector and private business there uh, with academia and trying to pool their knowledge and resources uh, both towards R&D and towards finding solutions. Do you see that cooperation um, uh, uh, on happening between the private and public sector to a great extent within your member states? Uh, yes, uh, every year we do have an uh, ASEAN Energy Business Forum uh, combining the policy sectors as well as the business sectors and including industrial sectors. Uh, this year, uh, we plan to have a triple helix, which is including these policy makers, business and industrial sectors, and also academy and research institution. So uh, looking at on those activities, uh, we really try to combine all of the stakeholders together to solve the energy issue, energy crisis, energy security, which is more reliable and, and sustainable as well as affordable. Uh, uh, and then we know that policymakers uh, themselves can also solve the energy uh, crisis issue, for example, or energy security issues, for example. So we have to really working together on those. And do you think any country in Asia can, 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 can hope to compete with China on cost? Uh, you know, how much, how much of a, a challenge is that? And it's nothing new, but uh, again, uh, China keeps driving down its costs more and more every day uh, uh, because of its size, because of its, of its uh, power, I suppose. So, so is that playing a part in incentivizing other nations to speed up that innovation or is it, is it uh, putting them off perhaps? Yes, then that can be also one of the factors that we need to speed up our R&D development on uh, also keeping up uh, the light behind on top of the technology. But we are on the direction, I mean, we are on the right direction on going uh, on this path. So, um, and we have to uh, uh, keep in mind that if we go into the energy transition, especially the RE, it's more on the local, locally, I mean, uh, the resource is locally available and the technology is better on the uh, local perspective rather than just imported for some somewhere else which is maybe uh, having a different uh, culture different climates uh, also different kind of resource for example the biomass itself maybe they have a different characteristic so uh, it is important for us to learn and to improve it ourselves to be a more local technology uh, wise rather than just uh, importing something that, from product. And, and that also certainly makes sense even on, on, on the physical goods and product side. The, the one big theme that's come out of uh, the pandemic is, is the whole you know, a question of supply chain across the board, across industries, and how nations are having yeah. to start to focus on being independently um, self-sufficient in, in that sense. And that, of course, extends to technology on, on the larger scale. Dr. Nuki Utama, Executive Director of the ASEAN Center for Energy, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our two-minute warning feature interview. Uh, thank you for your time and your insight, and uh, we hope to see you again very soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.